Okay, thanks for the uh, introduction and thanks for the invitation to, uh, to uh, come and talk today. So it was a pleasure to talk at EHP. And uh, so today I'm going to talk about joint work with Lenaik Shiza. Maybe Lenaik is in the room. Lenaik, no? Okay, so I can. Okay, too bad for him. Okay. And so, yeah, what I'm about to say, like, if you have questions, you should ask him because he's really like the core contributor to this work. But I try to answer uh, the best that I can. So a bit of context, so uh, we're going to do, uh, in this workshop, we talked a lot about like uh, large scale learning and this comes up like in all areas and this goes beyond advertising and computer vision. Okay, you can save lives uh, using like uh, machine learning. And so, uh, but in all of those uh, different disciplines, whether you work in industry or uh, other sciences, you have the need to uh, look at a lot of data in a semi-automatic way. And this has come up with a series of, uh, let's say, like buzzwords, that are called them hypes. So you would say like big data, maybe like eight years ago, then data science, and then ML, deep learning, uh, AI. And uh, one of the goals of today's talk is to talk a bit. So this is the last day of the workshop, just before lunch. So I want to give you some uh, food for thought. Let's talk a bit about the healthy interaction between like people doing theory. I would include myself in, uh, in that. People are closer to data and also the general hype uh, surrounding uh, uh, the whole area. Okay, so in this talk, I will detail like, some, uh, some works where I think the interaction between uh, theory and algorithms uh, were quite nice, and we see that as we go closer to deep learning, it's getting harder and harder, and we get like trapped in the classical deep learning traps, and I will mention what those traps are at the end of the talk. So one word about this, uh, this, uh, or this hype, so, there's been a lot of progress doing for like percep perception type uh, AI. So I put like NLP as an example for a uh, translation or a nice example from uh, uh, my neighbor, Satin Rea, like for object and action recognition. And this has been led by like three factors. That I think most of us agree on those three factors. First, a lot of data to learn from, okay, tons of uh, labeled images, a lot of computing power, but clearly, and I want to emphasize that, we are not using the exact same technology as 20 years ago. So there is some progress in, uh, in uh, algorithms and in uh, new methods. So at the end, what people call intelligence is a, is a mixture of models, algorithms, data, and computing power. So this is like very general, but I want to emphasize the fact that there is no universal uh, uh, technique. And still, we need to adapt a lot what we do to the type of data we need to work on. So today I'm going to focus mostly on the algorithmic part, which I will equate to machine learning. Okay. So now let's look a bit more at what I want to talk about, which is like supervised learning. So I'm going to consider for simplicity like some data X, I, Y, I. Can you think of X as being an image, Y as being a label on that image, and want to predict uh, Y given X. And this, this is going to be done by using uh, some function H of X parameters by uh, some vector theta. And classical examples, okay, where the money comes from, it's good like, to remember that we are all here today because there is advertisement uh, paying for us, at least indirectly, is that uh, we have like, uh, we want to show an ad, okay, the correct ad, and this uh, uh, corresponds to uh, uh, learning from a big uh, feature vector phi of x. Okay, so phi of x typically is composed of zeros and ones, like this like, uh, parameterizes your uh, search history or your uh, navigation history. And given that big sparse vector, you want to uh, predict. So here, N and D are pretty big. Okay, so this is like big for academic data sets. But if you work in industry, again, you can add some orders of magnitudes uh, uh, over that. So in that setup, what is traditionally used is like linear functions. Okay, so you take your big sparse vector and you predict as a linear functions. So this is a classical, uh, still classical examples. Then we have like uh, computer vision, which I already mentioned, where you want to predict, given an image, like some labels. So here, dogs, uh, dogs or cats. But now, linear functions do not work so much anymore. Okay, so this was the case like maybe 10 years ago, where you would build like some features by hand, phi of x, and do linear on phi of x. But now you need to do a bit better. And what people have been using quite a bit is neural networks, where you like uh, do a sequence of uh, linearity, the linear operators, and uh, and some uh, nonlinear functions. Okay, so uh, uh, we'll come back to that later. So essentially, I will talk about like both like linear predictions where things will be easy, and nonlinear predictions where things 
are, uh, are going to be uh, harder. But when I say linear, it's not in the data, but in the parameters. Okay, so for example, like Jean-Philippe probably talked about kernels for permutations. So this was non-linear over permutations, but linear over the parameters. All right, so we're going to minimize the uh, classically unempirical risk where I have like a loss uh, between like yi and, uh, and my prediction function. You can think of the loss as being d squared, so logistic, okay, smooth in any sense. The loss will be convex, so this is not a strong assumption, like most losses are convex. So people change the name, they say cross entropy, but it's still like a logistic at the end, and which is convex uh, in H. Okay, you add some regularizer to avoid overfitting. So one thing to keep in mind is that this is not the goal, this is, a, this is just a mean to an end. We minimize the empirical risk just to get a proxy for the test error. Okay, so it's not the topic of the talk, but keep in mind that the test error is really what you want uh, to minimize, so the error on unseen uh, data. And when I mean unseen, is that, that, I, that, that I have never seen before. Okay, validation set is not testing data. Small like reminder for the latest advances in computer vision. Okay. So, uh, complexity in machine learning. So, this is uh, uh, going to focus on what works quite well, uh, what, where things are uh, doing a uh, nice interaction between like theory and, and practice. Uh, so, we have a convex loss, and to me, this is like a weak assumption. But if you have linear predictions, so I mean, this is a strong uh, assumption, then things are convex and things are easy. Okay? And what I will show in a moment is that. Essentially, like theory and practice are matching uh, reasonably well, okay? And you can say that uh, in the last like 20 years, there were nice discussions between like theoreticians and practitioners, okay? There is no uh, judgment, like there's no, nobody is like better than the others, but people talk to each other. And I think this was uh, pretty uh, interesting. And at the end, uh, what I really liked is the fact that analysis that theoreticians could provide was somewhat quantitative. They would say, for that problem, you should need that amount of, uh, of computation. And Claire was, gave, gave an example for bandits. Okay, it's, it's clear, it's uh, quantitative. And often, uh, if you look at the analysis, this will suggest better ways of doing, of doing things. I will present examples uh, in a moment. OK, so this is what I call the golden years of convexity, so in machine learning. So, so the years, of course, are very subjective. And I left the final year uh, like uh, open uh, to discussion. Okay, I still put a one, which means that it's <laughs> one year, one year left. And there's a, a long, a long list. And if your preferred topic is not on that list, uh, can tell me and I can add it. Okay, so so SVMs of core kernels, people that do graphical models, so inference is using a lot of duality and convex duality. So very nice set of works. Of course, parsity and low rank. So this has been uh, uh, quite successful or like various convex relaxations, okay, of, of uh, typically unsupervised learning. Optimal transport, I think uh, Marco probably talked about it. Uh, and of course, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is more like large-scale learning, which is closer to my uh, research area, but I could like do the exact same uh, next 10 minutes for any of those topics where you have good results from theory, good empirical performance, and uh, some good exchange between theory and practice. Okay, so I'm going to focus uh, on uh, this one. All right, so uh, just like uh, five minutes on uh, something that, that has worked uh, quite well is trying to minimize a uh, finite sum. Okay, so this is uh, in machine learning the classical example when you have a loss plus some regularizer. And if you assume that the loss is convex and here the uh, function is linear in theta, so h of x is li linear in theta, then uh, this is a convex optimization problem. And there has been a sequence of works uh, trying to uh, uh, do uh, uh, stochastic gradient techniques which are exponentially convergent. Okay, so you, only, you, you end up converging after a, a small number of passes of the data, and this is a provable convergence. So this started with uh, co-authors like uh, uh, Nicolas Leroux and, uh, and Mark Schmidt, and then there has been a sequence uh, of works uh, uh, doing things which are in a, in a similar flavor with almost similar algorithms and similar guarantees. And at the end, the way they work is you start with the classical stochastic gradient recursion. What you see, you go from uh, step t minus 1 to step t by selecting a function at random here. I of t is uh, taken at random from the data. You compute the gradient of that function and take a gradient step. So this is slow because every gradient is very, is very noisy. And all of those techniques 
and this uh, uh, R essentially adding some terms, okay? And this is like, uh, I, would, I would not describe what the YI is, but this is just like stored value of some gradients. And this ends up uh, reducing the variance of the problem. And this variance reduction technique dates back from SVRG, okay? So at the end, you add a few lines and you get uh, things which are uh, 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 much faster than what you started from and both in theory and practice, and I will show the, the two aspects in a moment. This also has been accelerated, okay, so a very nice work by a series of people, and I will mention that the nice work of uh, uh, Hang Zhu Lin, Jun Amera, and Arshawi, and so uh, following very, like, quite theoretical arguments from Nesterov, you can accelerate those techniques. Without theory, you would never have been able to accelerate them in, in such a way. It's a case where you look at the bounds, look at the math, and this tells you how you should accelerate, and bam, it works in practice. So first, the, uh, the theory. So this is like, uh, uh, so this is a classical uh, uh, complexities for the problem. So if you want to reach a precision epsilon, so epsilon uh, smaller is better, and kappa is a condition number. So this is what characterizes the complexity of optimization. Think of kappa being n. So it's classical that for machine learning, the condition number grows with a number of examples. Then if you do like a uh, uh, gradient descent, no, let's do exactly this one. If you do uh, SGD, okay, then uh, the complexity is, does not depend on N. So here I'm, I'm, I'm plotting the running time uh, uh, guarantees. So you have, you have a good complexity in terms of N. Okay, it looks like independent of N, but the dependence of precision is uh, uh, not logarithmic. So this means that you need a lot of iterations to get to uh, a small precision. Gradient descent on the opposite is uh, good in terms of the dependence on the precision. Okay, it's logarithmic of one over epsilon. So this is what we call linear convergence. So this means that uh, you cut down the cost by a fixed constant at every iteration. But every iteration, you have to look at the entire data set. Okay, so it's linear in n per, per iteration. Then you can do acceleration. This is like Nestor of acceleration, where you improve over kappa by replacing the condition number by the square root condition number. But still, at the end, it's O of ND. So this means that if N and D are 10 to the 9th, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be uh, very, uh, very slow. Then all the techniques I've mentioned earlier, like those variance reduced techniques, then they achieve uh, essentially uh, going from N kappa to N plus kappa. So if kappa is the order of N, it's an N fold improvement over, over uh, gradient descent. Okay, so this is what theory uh, says. And then this has been accelerated uh, nicely, and then you get something which is uh, uh, you, uh, better. You replace kappa by that square root of n kappa. And now uh, 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 what you have is a quite a complete picture. The first one is, uh, uh, so now let's focus on the most important ones. Then you have, uh, uh, we do the, those new techniques, okay? So this is what we like to do a lot, and this was mentioned earlier uh, during the la uh, previous talk. We like to have lower bounds and upper bounds of complexity. And it turns out that both accelerated gradient and SGD are optimal for a given uh, model class, and that those new variance reduced techniques do improve. And of course, if you improve over like lower bounds, so uh, either you say Nimirovsky is, in co is, is wrong, this is like uh, not a good thing to try, but this means that you have some new assumptions. Okay, so clearly here, we are, we are using, we are leveraging the fact that we have a finite sum, okay, and not infinite. So typically, SGD is uh, Convergent also when you have a, an expectation over potentially infinitely many functions. And uh, we're, we're lever leveraging the fact that we can have access to individual functions. So if you see a new function again, we remember it. So this is where we, what we use. And compared to like full gradient, we have access to the, to the individual elements of the finite sum. And this allows us to improve over like previous lower bounds. And now, those nice algorithms over there, they, they do a match a uh, lower bound. It was nicely shown by Woodworth and Sebo and Lan uh, a few years ago. And now if you optimize finite sums, which are convex, only convex, and so on, then the best you can do is this, okay? And this is the best you could do, but this is the best you can do because uh, uh, this is the best you may do, lower bounds, but the best you can do, this is upper bound, and now uh, they match, okay? So this is, this is like for theory. So this is what theory is saying. Okay, so this is what I like to do with my students. This is the goal of what we do. Okay, and then hopefully we design methods that will achieve that. And it turns out that for that particular set of techniques, we do observe uh, a similar behavior. So the speed ups that I've mentioned 
in terms of running time, those were like, like uh, theorems, like proved sometimes a lot of sweat, okay? And they, they do end up uh, being shown in practice, so the details are not so important, but believe me that uh, when you go from techniques which are like AGD to batch gradient, the new techniques uh, end up being like uh, uh, significantly faster. So you see the good match between like empirical performance and what you see in the guarantees. And also, uh, what is very nice there is that uh, theory does suggest improvements. I've mentioned acceleration. I don't see how you can come up with acceleration without like having the proof uh, on, on the side uh, here. And also these, uh, you get some suggestions for improvement. So typically, you don't want to use uniform sampling. So you want to select your, your functions, not uniformly at random, but you often want to select the ones which vary, which, uh, the ones which vary more, uh, more often. And this is like, what you should do in practice. And to me, this is nicely suggested by, by theory. And if you do that, you do get improvements. So it's a case where uh, theory can tell to uh, practitioners, do this, it should work better. They try, it does work better. Okay, so you see like everybody is happy. All right, so this is like a, a summary of like when you use convex techniques. So after uh, like uh, several years of work, you get something where Good, uh, good match between empirical performance and, uh, and guarantees, and some nice uh, improvements uh, coming from uh, theory. So here I've mentioned like uh, I've mentioned uh, AGD, which I know well, but you could apply again the same type of uh, uh, argument for uh, con uh, general like uh, context losses. So if you do kernels, if you do randomized linear algebra, or if you do bandits, so there is a lot a lot of areas where uh, you can do similar, similar things. Then comes deep learning. Okay? So this is uh, where uh, the topic uh, uh, of the last part of the talk is, can we get something like that for deep learning? The answer is no at the moment, but uh, uh, hopefully we can do better uh, in, a, uh, in a few years. All right, so let's have a look at, um, at uh, deep learning. All right, so let's look at a classical like, uh, problem. I'm going to consider like a neural network. And so here, uh, uh, it's already a simplification compared to what people use in practice. So no convolution layers, no pooling, nothing, just like very, very basic, like a multi-layer uh, uh, neural network. And even later, I'm going to uh, only use a one hidden layer, but uh, at the moment I have two. Okay, so the goal is, what can we say about that problem? Okay, so the only difference with what I have presented earlier is that now my h of x is not only a linear function, but you have like uh, that thing which is a non-linear function of x, but this I already had before, but also a non-linear function of my parameters. Okay, so in a sense, when we do like linear supervised learning, we are essentially like assuming this is fixed, and now you're trying to learn the features as well. Okay, so this is uh, the goal. All right, so first, okay, so what, uh, what needs to be extended? Either this is you want to extend the statistical guarantees or you want to extend the optimization guarantees. So in this talk, I will focus mostly on optimization because for statistics, I think uh, there's already some works uh, showing that the fact that you have like many parameters, it's not the number of parameters that counts, it's like the norm of those parameters, or the norm which is properly defined, and if you want a nice uh, talk, you can look at this nice talk by Sasha Racklin or several papers showing that uh, neural networks, even deep, can generalize. It's not because they have many parameters that it's not, it's not, uh, it's not possible. Okay, so clearly there's still a lot of work to be done there, but uh, I want to focus on optimization. Okay, so for us, optimization is going to be non-convex because you have like a lot of non-linear interactions uh, over there. All right, so let's look at optimization. So we go, we leave the convex world. So as soon as you leave the convex world, everything starts to be a problem, okay? Of course, local minima, okay? So here, this is a function in 2D, okay, with two dimensions, and the, and, and, and the, the um, value of the function. You can have local minima, okay? So this is a global minimum, local minimum over there, also one over there. You can have stationary points, okay? Over there, over there, over there, over there as well. Can we have some plateaus? I don't have any at the moment. So at the end, you can initialize, you, know, you have to be careful the way you initialize. In a sense, you have to be super careful, okay? And the nice guarantees that we had before, where you launch it, it's going to work. So this was true for convex, it's not true for non-convex. So of course, people have looked at that. So there are two, uh, two uh, threads of work. The first one is say, okay, so we can't get global. Let's, let's, let's look 
at least at local guarantees. Okay, so at least what, you, what local guarantees can provide is that I can escape stationary points. Okay, so here, if I'm there, okay, so this is like in the path between that hole and that hole, and I know that I, if I'm here, the gradient is zero, so I will get, I will get stuck, and there are techniques uh, to avoid that. So here in 2D, it's kind of obvious because I have two directions, okay, this one, this one, and one is going down, the other one is going up. If I take random, if I take it randomly, I will, I will end up going down. But if you have like a few directions of, of descent on top of a, a million of directions of ascent, it's going to be more difficult. Okay, so there are a nice set of work showing that you can be like uh, robust to those like bad local behaviors, okay, and that's, uh, I prefer you the work of Lee and colleagues and Jean uh, and colleagues. But those are only local, okay? So you, you can get to a station to a good, like a local minimum, but this doesn't tell you anything about the actual behavior of the techniques. Then you might like to uh, get global guarantees. So first, a bit of like a downer, okay? That this, this is not going to happen in a such, a, such generality, okay? So whenever somebody is presenting uh, guarantees about global optimization, you have to show them that function. Okay, and imagine this in, uh, in dimension one million. Okay, it's super flat, but you have like a very tiny, a tiny spot over there. For this one, okay, there is no choice. The gradient is zero, okay. So I'm not very good at doing flat lines, but the gradient is zero everywhere. So unless you sample something over there, you will never be able uh, to get the global minimum. Okay, so at the end, this is the proof of the lower bound for uh, optimization. It's exponential in dimension. So whenever you see like Bayesian optimization, non-Bayesian, whatever, if you make no assumptions, it has to be exponential in theory. Okay, of course, you can, you, can, you can make extra assumptions to make it look better, but it has to be exponential. Okay, so global is hopeless. Okay, global for all functions is hopeless. Okay, this has been known for quite a while. The question is, we don't care about any function. So this is a super stupid function, okay, but stupid. Nobody would actually like to minimize something like that. So let's focus on what, uh, what we care about, which is uh, neural networks. Okay, so uh, this is uh, uh, I mean a strong focus of the community. And there's been a series of work uh, doing that. And uh, I think one nice work by uh, Choromanska and colleagues showing that essentially like, okay, if you can avoid like stationary points and end up in a local minimum, then all of them are uh, somewhat equivalent and if, uh, in terms of test performance, and if they are more or less equivalent for test performance, they are equivalent to the global minimum, which is good. So at the end, everything is, is nice. The issue is here, that result uh, requires a lot of independent assumptions which are not really met in practice. But this, is, this gives you at least examples of functions which are uh, nice to optimize. Then there's other work which try to show that uh, uh, all local there's no bad local minima, okay? zero bad local minima, so it's often called like no spurious local minima. So if you have an algorithm that can avoid those uh, stationary point, they will end up in the local minimum, and it has to be global. Okay, so it's, this started with a, a lot of like uh, similar behavior in like matrix factorization, a very nice book by Jen and Carr, and then for a neural network, this has been also worked on, I think, by uh, uh, Soltano Coltabi, Soltano Coltabi, sorry, I think I see him at the back of the room, no? Yeah, okay, so, so we, again, this provides a very nice uh, result, but still there are some assumptions which are uh, uh, not what people use in practice, and you may correct me if I'm, the, if you have many papers, so I, I may have missed uh, one of them, is that uh, that result is for quadratic activations. Okay, you assume like it's not like ReLU or Sigmoid, but so quadratic activations, so you, we are getting there, but it's not, uh, uh, it's not exactly what people use in practice. The goal would be, can we do uh, something about it? Okay, trying to look at what people uh, use and uh, get, some, get some form of guarantees. All right, so let, let me uh, look. So I'm going to reduce uh, the scope a lot. Okay, and I think the papers I mentioned earlier on, they were for deep, for deep like more than, uh, more than one hidden layer. What we are doing at the moment is only for a single hidden layer. So as you can see, uh, to get like stronger statements, we have to reduce the scope quite a bit. So I hope we can uh, re-enlarge the scope soon. Okay, we look at the, uh, so one, uh, one, uh, one hidden layer like that. Okay, so the way uh, we're going to see it, 
and we say we, this is common to many people in the community, is to see, uh, uh, so this is just the equality, to see a one hidden uh, neural network, which, uh, which is over there, as a linear combination of the predictions being done by the hidden neurons. Okay, so here, this uh, neuron okay, is taking inputs from the entire X. Okay, this is essentially uh, this uh, linear function. So those are the weights start for i equals 1. For this i, those are the weights which are doing the linear function. We take some nonlinearity and then we get some the uh, value of the hidden neurons. And because I'm combining all of those linearly with those weights, I get a function which is a linear combination of those of the outputs of these uh, hidden neurons. It's essentially uh, written uh, over there. Okay, so the why it works for a single hidden layer is the fact that uh, uh, there is no weight sharing. So the weights for that neuron are totally independent from the weights from that neuron. Okay, so if I had like another layer over there, the weights from that layer to, that, to this will be shared among like all of those, and then we get like uh, interactions, and we cannot do anything about it. So this only works for a single hidden layer. All right. So the way we're going to see it, we're going to abstract it a bit. And it is also very, very important when you work like on theory of on deep learning. Often, what people do does apply to a more general setting. Okay, and often uh, it's good that to rely that uh, where it can go to, because if it goes to too many things, maybe you're saying something trivial. Okay, so here we're going to uh, consider so edge, uh, 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 which is a, a, an average or a sum of our predictors. Okay, so here just to make the mapping between the psi and over there. C of the WI is the prediction obtained by the hidden neuron number I. Okay, so I get a neuron, so here. So WI uh, is uh, uh, including the output weight and the input weight from the input layer to, the, uh, to that neuron. Okay, so this is just a reparameterization. And from now on, I'm going to focus mostly on uh, those problems. Okay, so I'm predicting, so I have a predictor, okay, which is a, an average of functions. Okay. And we need to look at that. All right. Any question at this point before I go on to more technical things? OK, good. All right, so the main insight that we're going to, to follow, again, it's not our insight. This has been like uh, around for a while, is that if you take an average of, of, uh, of, uh, of functions like that, if you let m go to infinity, and so here we're trying to reach what we often call the over-parameterized regime, where I get more and more hidden neurons. And if I get more and more WI, then I get to, spill, uh, to, uh, to fill uh, the space. I can replace my empirical average by uh, uh, the integral of our measure, uh, d mu. And there is equality if that measure is uh, 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 the empirical measure of WI. Okay, this is just like a, a trivial statement. Okay? What is non-trivial is the fact that now we're going to look uh, over, uh, over measures where things will be, uh, will be nicer. Okay, so this dates back from Baron, probably earlier, and there's a nice set of work uh, doing this in statistics and uh, it's not processing. All right, so what, why, is it why it is interesting? Because now I've replaced my super non-convex thing in theta by something which is linear in mu, in d mu. Okay, so essentially I've reparameterized the problem to get something which is linear in d mu. Okay, so now uh, the, uh, I've, I've obtained like a totally convex problem because I've assumed that my loss is convex. So R will be like the test error, the training error, which is convex in my, in my function edge. This was uh, uh, what I uh, mentioned in the beginning. And I consider this as being a weak assumption. Okay, so this is like most like, uh, uh, most like uh, losses are convex. Okay. And uh, so it seems that it is over, okay? So I guess when you, when you get to convex problems, you, you should be happy because it's convex, hence it's, it's over. But the problem is it is convex in a, uh, in a space which is infinite dimensional, okay? The space of measures on RD, okay? So here, D will be the, num the, the number of input points, okay? Uh, well, number of, number of, input of input points plus one, so just to be clear. So W leaves, uh, WI parameterizes the ith color of theta 1 and theta 2. So if you start from D inputs, you have D plus 1 uh, values in WI. So measures on uh, a space of dimension D plus 1 is hard to parameterize. Okay? And there are techniques for that. Okay? So people which are familiar with sparsity-inducing norms, 
probably know about the Frank Wolf algorithm, which is like a, a way to greedily add uh, some, uh, some, uh, some predictors one after the other. Okay, this has uh, like different names depending on different communities. And so uh, you could use Frank Wolf to optimize other measures, but the issue is that uh, you have to decide which neuron to add at, uh, at every iteration. And this itself requires to solve a problem in dimension D plus one, which is NP harm. And so if you want to know more about that, I have a paper on that of a few years ago. So using the convex formulation of our measures does give some insights, but you don't get like an actual algorithms uh, to solve the problem. And even more, nobody cares. Okay, so why nobody cares? Because people don't use this in practice. Okay, what people use in practice is gradient descent or SGD. Okay, so let's try to analyze SGD. Okay, so okay, so let's try to do a look at SGD. So it's actually what people do in practice. They use this measure with the Dirac's. Okay, and they use like a backprop, which is just like a gradient descent on my on my neurons. Okay, so this is. Uh, this is uh, uh, what people use in practice. So let's try to use if you can understand what this means. So here, what we have done here was to go to the infinite number of uh, neurons, of hidden neurons. Can we do the same? Okay, it's often called the mean field limit uh, in physics. So can, what, does, uh, the, the, what, do we convert, what do we converge to when M gets large? So the first question. And then can we leverage this uh, analysis to prove some form of global convergence? Okay, so this is the goal of the last part of the talk. So the first result, what, what, is, what it converges to, so this has been like nicely laid out by uh, Nintendo and Suzuki uh, two years ago, it does converge to a Wasserstein gradient flow, and I will explain what it means uh, in a moment. And then uh, what we show with Lenaic uh, is that uh, you do convert to the optimal measure. Okay, so let's look at that uh, now. All right, so, uh, so this is what I'm going to consider. I'm going to consider again this is my predictors, okay, this is like my prediction function, R is my loss, and uh, uh, in practice, uh, I'm going to minimize uh, uh, the function parameterized by n neurons, so this is exactly what people do uh, when they look at uh, neural networks. Then, so here, so this is where uh, theory has to like make uh, things a bit, a bit simpler, okay, so one traditional way of studying gradient descent is to study the, to study the so-called gradient flow. So I'm not going to make like, like big steps, I'm going to make like steps uh, which are uh, infinitely, infinitesimally small, okay? So, so if I have, this is my function in 2D, gradient descent does this, okay? Then this, then this, then this, and the gradient flow will follow the steepest descent line and do something like that, okay? So of course, you can't implement it in a, com in a computer, really. Okay, but uh, what you can show, and that a nice thread of work uh, recently, is that the analysis of gradient descent can be more or less obtained by the analysis of the gradient flow. In the sense that if you take the gradient flow uh, here and use like, the Euler technique uh, to, uh, to, uh, to discretize it, you get back gradient descent. So there are, it's more complex, complex than that, because this is only true when the step sizes goes to zero, but let's forget about that. But what I'm going to do is to uh, uh, study the gradient flow, okay, which is the one way of uh, studying uh, uh, gradient descent. The bonus point is just it's also a way to study SGD. Okay, so this is like uh, something which is like uh, less known and not as uh, clearly, uh, not as clear as for uh, the non-stochastic version. But if I do SGD with an access to a new, dat new data point at every iteration, what you can show is that this goes very close to the gradient flow uh, uh, for the test error. Okay, so if I do SGD with a single pass, it's like I'm doing the gradient flow uh, on the test error. So this means that all the guarantees that you have, all the guarantees that we have on the gradient flow, for example, convergence of the global minimum will be more or less true for the test error. So why I say more or less? Because for this to be true, you have a list of assumptions which we didn't satisfy uh, yet. Okay, but in terms of, uh, uh, so here you see the first example where it's very hard for theory to really be applied to practice exactly, okay? So I think the, our goal here is to make the problem a bit simpler, okay, from the mathematical point of view, and uh, hopefully get, get insight for the actual behavior. So here, the way we make the people, uh, the people, I'm already, no. the way we make the problem simpler is by using gradient flow. All right. All right, so now let's look at the limit when m goes to infinity. So this is like 
when I'm considering like more and more neurons, okay? And again, this has been done by a series of people. I think the first ones were Nintendo and Suzuki. We worked on it with uh, Lenaik. Then there's a bunch of people doing it, uh, looking at it in the several uh, years. Very nice work by Montanari and his group. People at NYU, no, NYU, Chicago, a bunch of uh, other people, okay? So what I'm going to do now is do like uh, the intuitive proof uh, of that, what is a vast and gradient flow. Who, has already, who already knows what a vast and gradient flow is? Okay, so I think that next slide will be uh, useful. So let's look. So first, uh, what is a gradient flow? How do you get, uh, one way of defining the gradient flow is to, to say, I'm going to look at the gradient flow of a function f. Okay, so the way uh, you, you can build it is you want to solve the ODE. This is to solve the ODE. Uh, a dot is minus gradient of f at a. Okay, so one way of defining in a very uh, a bit like an intuitive way is to say if I start from a, this is a position at time t, and I want to the position at time t plus dt, then the way you're going to do it is by trying to minimize f, okay, respect to b. So b will be the position of uh, at t plus dt plus some deviation. I want to remain close and the and the and the uh, penalty. On the on the uh, on the procedure will be uh, with respect to the will be using the time the time uh, increment. Okay, so why is this true? Let me do the proof in that case. So you do this. So if you do if you write the optimate optimality conditions, so gradient with respect to b, gradient, okay, gradient over there, and you set it to zero, okay, and now so b should be the uh, uh, satisfying something like that. And now we can use like leverage some extra information that f, if f is smooth, then the gradient with at, at b and a is small. Since I make a small step, okay, so the gradient should not change uh, uh, too much. And now if you replace uh, gradient of f at b by gradient of f at a, then uh, uh, you get that a is actually a minus dt uh, times the gradient of f at a. Okay, so if you rewrite this a bit, you get that a of t plus dt, Okay, is a minus dt times the uh, uh, the uh, gradient of f of a. Okay, so if you subtract and divide by dt, you recover the ODE. Okay, so this is of course like not hand waving, but this is a very intuitive way of deriving uh, uh, that the gradient flow ends up minimizing something like this. But we're going to need this to define what the vast gradient flow is. Okay, we're not there's. No, there's no access to derivatives for measures, so we have to go through that uh, artifact. So we're going to uh, do a sort of shit like this. So we're going to, to look, b will be a measure, a will be a measure, b will be a measure, and we will have a distance of our measures. And then we can see uh, what to do. Okay, so let's look at the problem. So we're going to start from a measure. So again, the measure is, will be like a, a measure of my neurons. Okay, I have a bunch of neurons, okay? And I want to see how the neurons should move as the next, as the next iteration. So mu is a measure at time t. I want to see uh, how I can define the measure at time t plus dt, which I call it mu. And I'm going to do the exact same thing uh, uh, as before. I'm going to define, so f is a test error for the neurons parameterized by mu. And I'm going to uh, ensure that mu and mu are close in some sense, okay? And I divide by uh, dt to make sure that I don't move too much. Now the question is, what, what should I use for the measure? So first, f of nu, by definition, this is my test error. R is my test error at my predictor, which is the average over d mu of my uh, individual neurons. Now to define w2, so here I'm using the so-called Wasserstein uh, 2 uh, distance, which is uh, defined uh, over there. So the way it is defined is, when I have mu and nu, I'm going to consider all joint distributions between mu and nu, okay? And when I have that joint distribution, I'm computing the expected uh, square difference like that, okay? And then I'm trying to find uh, the joint distribution that makes this, that makes this uh, 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 as small uh, as, uh, as possible. And this happens to be like a, a square distance uh, over measures. And if you have heard like the talk of uh, uh, Marco Couturier, this should be like uh, uh, familiar. Okay, so here we use the proper definition of distance between measures. If we were to use like the L2 distance between densities, then this will not work. Okay. So now this is what we want to, to solve, okay, with respect to new. So let's, look, uh, let's look at it. So this will be a bit mathy, but this is really what, what's happening. So this is not our work with the next, it's simply like uh, reproving what the Wasserstein gradient flow is. 
Okay, so this is, uh, so we're going to do some Taylor expansion around uh, mu because the, the measure, so points don't, do not move too much. So in the previous slide, A and B were close. So here, mu and mu are close. So you do a Taylor expansion around like mu. This is a gradient of R plus a deviation between this at mu minus this at mu. But with respect to mu, it's constant. So I only keep that, uh, the, the term in mu. This is just the exact same thing, I put the dt inside. Okay. So once I have that, I can go on now, and this is why it works, is that you, you see that you have two measures. You have d nu over there, and you have d gamma over there. But uh, the marginal of uh, gamma with respect to v is nu. So this means that I can move this inside, inside and stuck it with that, because this does not depend on, 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 uh, on w. Hence, if I take the expectation with respect to w in v, I will get a marginal over v, and I get d nu. Okay, this is what, what makes it work, is the fact that we use a proper notion of, uh, of measures. And once we are, we are there, we are almost done. Why? Because we are trying to uh, optimize, so we have a joint distribution, okay, where mu is fixed. Okay? I want to optimize over nu, and I want to, I want to optimize over gamma. Okay? And this is essentially what is fixed over there, over gamma, is only the uh, distribution over W. So what, what you have now is a problem where I have a joint distribution, I fix a marginal, and I want to maximize the expectation over the other variable. And what is always the case is you always get the uh, uh, given a W, sample from you, then you have to maximize, uh, uh, here minimize, what you have inside. Okay, this is whatever you have here, Okay, whenever you want to uh, maxim minimize the linear function of your, of your measure, so an expectation, if you fix one of the marginals, the minimizer with respect to all the rest has to be doing a maximization. And this is what's happening over there. Given some W sample from you, you know that mu should be a Dirac at the uh, global optimizer of that thing. Okay. And so, and now, if you, if you look at it, uh, that thing is essentially minimizing this, and you see exactly the gradient flow that I had uh, as a previous uh, slide. Okay, so now I have minimization over particles, W, and now this is like a distance in L2 norm, okay? Now I have to take, uh, uh, you know, I have to take the de derivative of this with respect to uh, V, and I get this, and I get my, I get my thing. So here, if this is like a bit like uh, too fast, you can have a look again uh, later. It's just to give you the flavor that there's nothing, nothing magic uh, about what's happening. So now, if you start with a mu, which is a bunch of particles, okay, this is what I'm going to, uh, to do at the end, then uh, mu at t plus dt will also be a bunch of particles, but now the, the new particles vi will have moved by, uh, by some elements. Okay? So at the end, what you can show is that it's actually like moving particles, so here neurons, is equivalent to this so-called Wasserstein gradient flow. Okay? So at the end, I'm going to move particles, okay, uh, 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 and the key, the key point is that this movement is not independent. So why is it not independent? Because uh, this will couple the various, uh, this will couple the various particles. So it's not, so what you're doing is not doing random restarts, okay, and trying to see uh, uh, which one gets lower. There are some interactions among the particles because you, you have this uh, coupling factor. All right, so now this is uh, uh, what we have. We have particles that evolve according to something. And here, uh, what you recognize, this is exactly the gradient of my, uh, of my, my function. Okay, so if I go back here, this is my particles over there. And now if you do the gradient flow on the problem with a fixed number of particles here, boom, then uh, you get, just apply the chain rule, like a, apply the chain rule, and uh, believe me, you get a uh, good uh, gradient flow. Okay, so here, I know it's a big technical, but it's just to realize that uh, the Wasserstein gradient flow is an object which is uh, uh, it's a bit abstract, but can be made precise if you have a finite number of particles. All right, so the question is now, do we get global convergence? Okay, it's all nice to give a name to the limit, but uh, is it globally convergent? So two issues, the first one is, you may have like a lot of local minimum. Okay, so here, we are not in a situation where uh, you have like a single good minimum and you reach, you reach it. You have, you, have some, uh, you have some local minimum. And one simple proof is that since this includes like classical backpropagation on a one hidden layer neural network, we know that sometimes you get stuck. Okay, so this is a, 
uh, you have local minimum, and uh, to make the decision for the experts, the globally, the global, the global measure is singular. Okay, so let's, let's make it All right, so what do we need to make it work? We need two ingredients. The first one is homogeneity. Okay, and I will like uh, so essentially we need that our like uh, predictors have some form of homogeneity. It will not work, at least our proof will not work if you take any uh, any uh, if you take any any uh, set of predictors. You need some form of homogeneity. The neural networks are at least homogeneous with respect to the second to the last layer. If you use the ReLU, it's globally homogeneous. Okay, and you need to have a sufficiently spread uh, a measure. Okay, you need to put uh, points uh, in all directions. Okay, so you need to, to cover the entire sphere of directions. Okay, so here I'm closing over like, oh, I'm not looking at many details. You can look at the paper. And for those who like like a spark deconvolution, the exact same thing applies to spark deconvolution, where WI is the, local, the location of the spike. All right, so, so here what, uh, what we prove is that if you get enough neurons, you should converge to the global optimum. Okay, so here we took a very simple problem, okay, problem in 2D, and when you generate data uh, from a neural network with five neurons, and we see if we learn with five neurons, 10 neurons, so 100 neurons, do we recover the correct, the correct thing? Okay, so what theory, theory is suggesting is that if I take a lot, it should converge to the global optimum, and essentially, all my neurons will end up converging along those lines, which are the optimal ones. So if I take the exact correct number of neurons, I don't. Okay? So this is uh, illustrating the fact that although the global optimum for those five neurons should be on the, on the, on the generating neurons, a uh, uh, greater descent does not attain it. And I get, when I get to 10 or 100, then uh, 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 it's, it's enough empirically. So here, what we show, we show that if the number of neurons is big enough, it's going to work. We are not showing, unfortunately, we need that many neurons. Okay, at the moment, it's not quantitative at all. But we have a video. <laughs> this is a video of that thing on the right. As you can see, uh, 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 the gradient flow is doing something weird. Okay, it's not going straight from, oh, let's go from there and directly to my neuron. It's doing some uh, funky uh, thing. So since it is nice, I'm going to show it again. So this is, uh, yeah, you go there, and I, I like this one. Whoop, you think you're there, but not, okay? <laughs> right, so, uh, yeah, so this is like the videos. And boom, boom, boom. And then, okay, so, uh, okay, so one, one, uh, one thing is, uh, uh, can, we, can we say something about the uh, uh, number of neurons? Okay, we cannot at the moment, but we can try to see uh, uh, if, Empirically, the number of neurons is sufficient. So what we have done, essentially the same type of uh, same, same type as uh, uh, same type of simulation as before. I assume I have some neurons M0, which, which is generating my data, and I run with the number of neurons, and I see when I get the global optimum using gradient flow. Okay, and if you uh, do it, you can see after like this is like uh, 100 over there. Okay, so if uh, this is the number of neurons that, that we have used, I think 20 here then it doesn't work, and if you, if you are a bit bigger than the, the true number, you do better. Okay, so here, our goal now is to show that this is happening, this, can, can we show something like this, that if we have a good number of neurons, do we get global optimum? We cannot at the moment, but this is the type of thing we like to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to have. And for the last few minutes, uh, let me uh, uh, try to look at other works which have tried to go from qualitative to uh, quantitative uh, results. The first one, with very nice work by uh, Montanari and uh, May Montanari and Guyen, is to add like a, a, a bit of noise. Okay, what makes it difficult in practice for the analysis is that the final measure is singular. So if you add some noise, you would never be singular, and things are a bit easier. So it's a bit à la, à la Langevin for the expert in the room. And so here they get they get a very nice result that, oh, if you need the mean field limit, okay, is attained after a given number of neurons. Okay, so this is very nice, but this is still not the you need to add some noise uh, in the algorithm. Then, in the last like uh, a few months, there was a bit uh, sequence of archive papers, okay, and uh, 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 and so to me this is like typical computer vision, where like you like uh, you put an archive to plant the flag, okay, and uh, this is uh, this is like happening also to us as well, okay, and what they are doing, okay, is they are showing uh, things which are much stronger than what I'm presenting. 
Okay, they show like global quantitative linear convergence of gradient descent. So not only it does convert to the global optimum, but it does so exponentially fast. And then what is great is that it does it does extend not only to not only to uh, one hidden layer, but to all problems. Okay, so I think this is uh, this is very great. And let's try to see uh, if uh, what it means. Okay, so what I've presented today is the so-called mean field limit. Okay, where uh, where I'm going the average uh, of, of our neurons, and we need to initialize randomly. Okay, and then we show that the dynamics is uh, equivalent to some Wasserstein gradient flow. Okay, and we get convergence to the global optimum, no quantitative uh, elements. Uh, so what they show, okay, essentially, so the, if you want to uh, see the difference, is what they end up doing is initially these weights, which are like uh, square root of m times bigger, okay, much, uh, much bigger weight. So the question, well, the question is, where does, it, where does it converge to? Okay. And so what we have done uh, with Enric like uh, late last year is to show that at the end, uh, what is happening is that they are just simulating a kernel method. Okay, and, uh, and what you can show is that the neurons that they generate do not move. Okay, so let's look at that. So this is like, uh, now we're looking at um, same thing, generic criterion. Okay, so now, as you can see, we have moved away even from uh, everything, neural networks. We have like any differentiable function H, okay, and we are going to approximate it like, like this. And so the way uh, uh, it works is that if you initialize these big weights, this corresponds to adding a big, a big scale factor alpha. Okay, and then uh, they end up minimizing something like this. And the key in all of those papers is to uh, make sure that at, when you take alpha very big, you make sure that the way, you, the way you initialize is to have alpha W0 bounded. So if you initialize W in a, in a, in a weird way, if alpha is big, this will be big. Okay, and the way they do it, by a fine way of doing initialization, you have like alpha being very large and W being uh, uh, reasonably small. If this is the case, then you can show, and this is what we end up showing uh, with Enaic, and all of those papers are showing this implicitly, we're just putting like, extracting the key element uh, uh, in the proof is that if you assume like some assumptions, if you manage to initialize with W0 being very large, uh, very small, uh, no, being very small so that alpha is uh, times this is not too, not, too, not too large, then you can show that the neurons don't move, okay? So they move only up to one over alpha, so if alpha is very large, you don't move. And what you can show is that, uh, essentially, uh, your predictor is, does convert to the global, global optimum. Okay, so first, it has nothing to do with training error. This is always, uh, always true. But what is really important is the fact that if your neurons don't move, okay, this means that your edge of W is close to H of W0 plus some deviation. Okay, so you can do like a first order Taylor expansion. Now what you have here is a linear model. Okay, so you end up uh, uh, using a complex non-linear model to end up training a linear model. Okay, so at the end, and this is what you, what you see. So this is, is the same picture as before. You start from lazy training. Okay, you, the neurons move a bit. And if you go to uh, big initialization, so here, this is the exact same scale, so you reduce. Neurons don't move, okay? And if you put more, if you put more on them, this is like in our situation where neurons are initialized like a bit everywhere, so they do convert the global optima, whereas uh, in the lazy regime, neurons don't move, okay? So you take a, a lot of them and they move, uh, uh, they almost don't move. All right, so this is, okay. so at the end, the question is, okay, all of those techniques end up being equivalent to kernel methods. So I love kernels, okay, so uh, this is great. They have great things like they, they work, okay, so they still predict correctly because it's non parametric technique, okay, but the question is, this, does this really like demystify uh, the behavior as they explain? My answer is uh, yes, in a sense, because at least they get guarantees for deep networks, which I think is very good, but at the end, it's just like a fancy way of doing kernel methods. And above all, the neurons don't move. I think this is really, uh, really a problem. All right, so now, what, what, who's, who's right? Okay, so I'm putting like, things against the other. Okay, so the question is not clear. And right now, in the ongoing war with Edouard or Yalon, which I've seen somewhere, okay, okay, we're trying to see which one, uh, which regime uh, is really attained. And, uh, and here, what it means is that 
we have to be closer to physics now, in the sense that we, we have potential behaviors with math and which one we see in practice, and we, de we are deriving experiments for that. And the final slide, because I'm a bit of our time, is just to give you like, uh, some topics of discussion for lunch, is how can we have healthy interactions between like, theory and applications and the hype? Okay, so here, uh, so first, I think uh, we cannot really ignore that deep learning works. Okay, that would be stupid, okay? And uh, we cannot like, always uh, study the exact same techniques because we have convergence guarantees where the other rest of the world is doing something like, uh, that we don't understand. So I think we cannot really ignore it, but we should not like, really uh, fall in the like, two traps okay, of deep learning, which I've mentioned earlier in the talk. The first one is hype over substance, okay? So I, I think you're all uh, familiar with that. But to me, the most important one is that uh, uh, we should not like, lower our standards, okay? We should not start to say, if it works, we are fine, make, make a bunch of money. We should really like, uh, keep on doing what we like to do. In particular, be very critical and, and mention the limits, okay? Whenever you have a result, okay, you have limits, okay? So in my case, I've mentioned the limits. Okay, it's like one hidden layer, not, not quantitative. There are many, many, many things we can improve. But the tendency uh, with the hype is that the limits you don't say or you hide, and I think this is really a, really a problem. And the final point is that rigorous does not mean having a bound. Okay? So there are a lot of like, uh, uh, sciences which cannot prove everything. We had EHP. EHP, I think, is the home of physics and theoretical physics. They can't prove everything, okay? They have nice interaction between modeling and experiments, and I think we could do this as well. But when they do experiments, it's not uh, running an experiment on 20 GPUs, and as soon as it works, you stop, okay? This is a bit more rigorous than that, and I believe this is possible, and I hope that uh, we will, as a community, uh, start doing this. Thank you for your attention. Okay, uh, a couple of uh, questions, maybe, or lunch. <laughs> no one? Okay, you're all hungry. <laughs> Hi, thank you, thank you for the talk. Um, my, my question is not about this specific yeah. piece of work, but there's an issue that raised several times during the three months, and yeah. I wanted to know what you think about it. So, um, related to the hype and uh, the fact that a lot of people are working in this area in different angles. Um, there is a, a phenomenon where sometimes you're working on something and many other groups are working on similar things and there's a tendency for people to go for the more or less low-hanging fruit, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Uh, a lot of people are feeling frustrated about that and that they, they feel they can't, don't have enough time to really develop results. They have to rush and submit or put it in an archive. How are you addressing this in your group and what are you feelings about this? No, so I think it's a sort of frustration for, uh, for us in the sense that um, the answer is like, if what you do can be done by 10 other people, don't do it. This is, a, this is our answer. We work on things which we know that uh, we have a view, a viewpoint which is uh, rather unique, uh, because if you have too many like, competitors, I think it's it's difficult, in particular for students. For me, I don't care, okay? Uh, but for students, you start a PhD, and every week you look at an archive hoping that uh, you're not, uh, you don't see your paper being published. This is not a good life for PhD students, and so this is our role as PhD advisors to make sure that you don't put, like, on a topic where you have, like, 20 groups. It was a bit the same for sparsity, uh, like, five years ago. You had all the brilliant people from applied math doing similar things. And this was very tough because any new improvement will be done by... Uh, so if you're a student and you fight against Emmanuel Cornes, it's kind of difficult, okay? And we have similar things appearing here. You fight against like other groups and big groups, and I think it's not, it's, a, it's really a problem. And, uh, and also the other problem is that people that do flag planting, and this is like okay, a, a, an anecdote, when a paper is ready for a conference, I don't submit before the conference because I look at people may uh, use it and uh, reuse the same thing to submit to, to submit to the conference. So I think we have reached a, a competition, which is, I think, totally unhealthy, where uh, people like, uh, want to get papers published and are, really, are willing to do anything uh, to make it happen. 
And so uh, this is our role as uh, like we have like leadership positions in conferences to avoid that. But it's very difficult to fight against like 10,000 people wanting to have a paper at NIPS. So I, have, I don't have a good answer, but I'm, yeah, there are problems that we need to solve. Uh, otherwise, it's going to be a lot of depression for students. And I mean, it, it, actual depressions. It's not, it's not a joke. It's like, it, this does happen a lot because it's too stressful and it's not good. <coughs> Sorry for the <laughs> down there. <laughs> Thank you for this last time. No, I think it's great. Okay, <laughs> no, no, it's, um, <laughs> Uh, okay, <laughs> so let's thank you. <laughs> uh. <laughs>